That's Mark Gunther right there leading the horses on the wagon. His mom and dad, John and Emma, first came to Tennessee in 1965. They settled here in Muddy Pond, Tennessee, where they started producing sorghum cane and making sorghum in the fall. Over the past 50 years, they've become quite well known for their sorghum operation. But we're going to follow them throughout the year, and you're going to learn their story and hear how they was raised up, Old Order Mennonites, and what it was like as a teenager growing up here on the farm. Come along on a wagon ride and meet the Gunthers of Muddy Pond. You gonna say hey? This is his favorite part. You've been waiting for the hay ride all day, right? He's asked me how long, how many minutes. Hello. Hello. I'm John. Talk I'm, to you on the phone, Mark. Yeah. Been watching some of your videos while you've been down in Florida there. Have you? <laughs> Looks like you got away from this cold weather for a few yeah, weeks. It was. It was nice down there. Yeah. It was nice. Yeah. So you're getting ready to take everybody on a ride? Anybody wants to pile on? Well, I guess I'll get on there and go you with you. Pile on too? I'm gonna go with y'all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about these horses. Those okay. are some big horses. Okay. Well, the one on the other side, the the one on the other side here is Fauna. She is 11 years old. The mother to Frida, who is uh, coming up four years old. Fauna actually is pregnant. Frida is not pregnant. Uh, Belgian horses that have been in our family since. 1982. Dad bought her grandmother from uh, up north in Indiana back in 1982 and just been a very docile uh, family of horses. And, and so now then we actually have a, <clears throat> a one-year-old daughter out of Frida and uh, plan to keep raising that family of horses. Well, it's yeah. a good tradition going on there. Yeah. Dad, Dad was very fond of Belgian horses. He, he liked Belgian horses. He didn't like Perchern's or Clydesdale's, he was fond of Belgian, and I guess that uh, I got a good dose of it. I, I enjoy working them. Hey, how are you? It's so good to see you here. He's on the horse. I bet you there ain't. Judy, would you say there's half of us here? Not either. There's not even half of us here. No, your kids aren't here. I mean, <laughs> there's a bunch of us in this. <laughs> My children aren't here either. So where can I get out in here? Do you want to get off on the Yeah, why don't you do that? Hey, well, you sit up here. Okay. Oh. All right, all aboard. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, I didn't bring my... I had to get ready to break. I'm going to change sides with you, Jake. Jake, get up and ha handle the break. You'll, you'll need to stand up so you can apply pressure. We've got a lot of weight on your apply, apply pressure. Apply pressure. So back in the days when... I and my brothers and our only sister were were uh, growing up. We rarely did this, but we did this every day as a means of transportation. We didn't do it for a Sunday afternoon pleasure ride. It's, this was our only way of transportation: hitch up the wagon and go to go visit some of the other families, neighbors. But now that's uh, well, we don't use the horses anymore for a means of. Uh, of, of, of using them for agriculture or for working them in the fields. I mean, I do a little bit because they need to be worked to keep them in good behavior and then occasionally take a Sunday afternoon ride, but it's not done nearly like it was when we were growing up. Turn right here. Easy, girl. Come on right here, ye. Come right here, ye. Come right here, ye. Easy, girl. Easy, girl. guiding these horses with the lines but it always helps to to talk to horses like now both of those signals mean forward mean go go mean stop but using both of them makes them obey better ye, ye means to turn to the right ha means to turn to the left so you'll hear me talking to the horses and and when i talk to them and then start pulling on the lines they they just uh, respond better by talking to them and steering them. Do 
town growing up, my grandma and grandpa lived right here and we called this the sand road. There was not nearly cars and trucks around like there are today and the road held up good. It was just a solid bed of sand. And I remember us riding here to my grandma and grandpa and then the other grandparents lived right there close to the cemetery where we're going. And we would love to ride on this section of, of uh, sand road. And if anybody did fall off, that fall on the sand road wasn't nearly as bad. <laughs> yeah. Come on. What year was that? Well, it was when we were little growing up. So your great grandparents sister too? Yes. Okay. On, on mom's side. This is where they lived, on mom's side. And then uh, when, when they got a little older and couldn't farm anymore, dad bought their farm, bought the whole farm and joined it together with his and gave them a lifetime right to live here. And they did. They lived here for a lot until they died. And then one of our uh, brothers, Leonard, bought it from dad. And... Uh, Leonard decided not to live here anymore, and now Brother Ben owns it. But it's it stayed in the family. Easy girl. And this was Grandpa Mazlin's old barn here. He had that's, he milked his cows. And, yeah. Easy girl. Easy girl. He's holding the brakes. So right over here on the left, where the little white car is sitting, there's. Still the little building there that was my grandparents' greenhouse. The house was right on the other side of that greenhouse and the barn was over just to the right of that willow tree that's greening up there. But that's where my dad's parents lived. So, you know, we were all pretty close here and we could travel back and forth with horses and either on bareback or horses and wagon. And grandparents were getting older and we had to help them with a lot of farming, hauled a lot of manure. Brother Pete and I hauled a lot of manure for them and worked their fields, and, but right here is where they lived. Since then, well, un down. unfortunately, we allowed this farm to be sold out of the family, and then now then it's been sold several times. In the meantime, the original barn and house ended up burning. Well, maybe the barn got bulldozed, I'm not sure, but regretfully, we let that slip out of the family. It just didn't seem like we needed it or could afford it at the time and we let it slip out of the family i think it sold for forty nine thousand dollars it's probably worth three or four hundred thousand now what's the name of the road we're on here we, we are actually on habegger loop here so further on down this hill uh we probably won't drive down there today but there's some other dwellings down there the habegger family lived there so there was like uh three brothers that lived one of them lived at this barn and the other one lived uh, where you can barely see the building way over there and another one to the left and ended up the road when 911 came through the road uh got the name of habegger loop it actually loops all the way around goes back to the main road and uh those folks all moved to a a pl uh I, I guess i guess when we jumped the fence and became worldly they decided to move to a plainer group of people, which was at Scottsville, Kentucky. So that's where they're all living now. Well, the older people, they've all passed away, but yeah. All right, we'll ease on down to the cemetery. Easy. Come on. So from where we started out, started the wagon ride where mom and dad live now, that farm continues all the way down to here. It's all one piece of land. This is where mom and dad started in 1965. They moved, they built a little house, which also burned. You can see remnants of an old barn there, but they built that house there uh, in February and the first part of March in 1965, uh, moved in it uh, and had lived there two weeks when I was born, right down here. And mom and dad lived at that place there uh, till, uh, <coughs> who was baby? Leonard was a baby. Leonard was a baby in 19... In the fall of 1971, they moved up to where we just left now. But this is where our family has been. And while they were down here, so I was born here. My sister Judy, I thought she was on the way. Sister Judy was, on, was born here. Pete was born right down here. Benny and Leonard were born here. So four of us oldest ones were born right down here. But that farm is connected all the way up to where we were. Now, one of the other brothers, Ben, owns all that now. But Dad set it up that it couldn't be sold out of the family. So it's going to stay in the family. 
So this is the little cemetery where mom and dad are buried. Both grandparents on both sides are buried here. Several aunts and uncles. Yeah. The, the cemetery actually was started in the late 1800s and was just a small cemetery here called Week Cemetery. You do not have to own a plot to be buried here. Uh, we, the community, take care of the cemetery. There is a, a couple of directors that you have to ask permission to be buried here, but uh, it's called Weeks Cemetery and uh, just our little community cemetery here. Around here, ha, fauna, around here, ha. The tombstone right here with a little bouquet of flowers on it, that's where mom and dad are. Dad actually put that tombstone there himself. Mom's uh, death date's not been put in it yet. And just to the right of the tree there is was mom's sister that died of a young age from cancer. Behind it were mom's parents and uh, many other relatives. So just a little knob right here out in the middle and sort of a neat place, I guess, for, to, for a cemetery and that's where it was chosen. And way in the back there, you can see where the field stones are tipped against each other and if you spend enough time and uh, clean the, the, the writing that's on them you can read them. It was in the late 1800s. A large grant, a large land grant was granted to a Weeks family from the US government and they got several thousand acres here in the area. But those were the folks that got that and started this cemetery here. And of course, after that, their heirs, it all got divided up. And, but in 1965, when mom and dad and that group of people moved here, they bought 700 acres for $27 an acre here in, in all this area, which goes all the way up to where mom and dad lived. And of course, it got divided up and yeah. Skipped, she missed a uh, cycle there, or didn't conceive. 
Charlotte. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. What's your name? Charlotte. Charlotte. Yeah. And we have Andrea's at home. She's 16, and then Isaac is 19, and then Lana is our youngest. She's running around here somewhere. So we have three girls and one boy. Okay, I have an Isaac too. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he got. Um, Charlie's done a whole bunch of. Oh, on a roll. <laughs> That's sweet. For spelling and stickers. So these are old uh, school yearbooks for my grandma's school when she taught at the little schoolhouse. And this was some of Davey's um, work. And just a record of okay, their day to that book. A list of visitors who visited the school in 1987. And this is Marie Gunther. That would be my great grandmother. 1987. We were just talking about that. We're going to do it, uh, I guess, Thursday and Friday. The second and the third, do you remember? Yes, will that work for you? I can do the second, but barely the third. It's supposed to be rainy weather, it'd be a good time to do that. So. I have a closing at 10. It won't be two full days, because uh, it's just one house, but uh, two, two good parcel days. Yeah. I've been trying to tell her that. Thank you guys for doing so much. You've been giving me a hard time about this. So the water came from where? They had running water at the time? They did, yeah. And before they had running water, they had a... A well, a well out there that so, had so even with running water, they still kept the. So this was just a um, drinking bucket. You, yeah. fill it, you fill up the bucket from the well and set it in here, and you get your dip out. And everybody drank out of it. You didn't get your own separate cup or about stirs or COVID or anything like that. Right. So when you came in, you just got your drink of water. Yep. Yep. Really good immune systems they do. Yeah. <laughs> so up to how long ago has that been used like that? When was the last time it was used with water in it? It's been several many years many years um, eddie and i got married in 1998 and they we lived here for a little while we lived when we got married when we was 17 and uh eddie's parents just told us to come live with them because we didn't have anywhere to go so they were still drinking out of that bucket when we moved in here so 98 yeah 98 and i think it carried on for a few years after yeah. that because i definitely remember right. yeah. um some of my younger siblings having memories of it too <laughs> Hey, this is Holly. I'm here again in my grandma's house in Muddy Pond, Tennessee. And today I'm with some of my family members. I'm with my husband, Nathan, and my dad, Mark, and his wife, Sherry, and some of my uncles and my aunts. This is Ben and Eddie and Ruth and my sister, Heather, and my uncle, Jonah, my aunt, Judy, and my aunt, Doreen. So they're going to tell us a little bit of, about our family history and, and where we came from. And so we're going to start with my dad and he's gonna tell about how um, my grandparents came here and just a little bit of their history. So uh, dad's family, uh, his parents and dad, they came from Saskatchewan, Canada, and this was quite a different world for them. And mother's, uh, mom's family came from Berman, Indiana. Both sides of the family were pretty much strictly horse and buggy. They were very plain. Uh, dad's family was involved in some type of a Mennonite group in Canada and came here to they they uh, dad's family moved to Pennsylvania in 1961 I believe it was and there's where he met my mother and her family and they had came originally from Bern, Indiana but also lived in Pennsylvania at that time and mom and dad got married in Pennsylvania and uh, wasn't long after they got married they uh, there was church trouble and uh, a bunch of them got expelled and uh and so along with uh, mom's parents and dad's parents, uh, there was a search sent out and found land here in Tennessee, here in Muddy Pond, Tennessee. And uh, in 1965, in January of 1965, moved here to Tennessee. And were 100% completely horse and buggy. The only thing that the church did allow us to have, uh, we had chainsaws to clear the land and allowed uh, other people to come, other farmers to come in with a tractor and hay baler to 
to bale our hay. We were allowed to hire someone with a bulldozer to clear land, to dig ponds, things like that. Otherwise, we were 100% strictly horse and buggy. And so mom and dad belonged to this church, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, things went fairly smooth for a number of years. But uh, in the late, e uh, the late 70s, early 1980, I guess it was, there were some issues that came up um, with baptism. The use of the chainsaw, there was others that felt like we should not be allowed to have that. Uh, Mom and Dad and I guess two other families uh, didn't agree with everything that was being forced on them. And uh, long story short, Mom and Dad ended up expelled out of that church. And of course, I was 16 years old in 1981 when uh, they got expelled. And I guess maybe I had uh, too much rebellious influence on my younger siblings. And... Um, I wanted, I wanted more than the chainsaw. I didn't just want the chainsaw. But anyway, it spiraled uh, away from strictly horse and buggy. Mom and dad did drag their feet for a long time and did not really want to go along with it. But dad did give in. He went along with it. Mom never gave in. Um, You're she, talking about he gave in on the modernization? He, of dad things. gave in on the modernization. Mom never gave in on the modernization. And uh, we uh, <clears throat> just completely, us, uh, us children, we completely left that conservative horse and buggy way of life. But I will say uh, in my life, uh, me being the oldest, at that time when I was a teenager, I did want to get away from it. Um, I wanted the more convenient, easy things of the world, and I do enjoy those today but I really enjoy working the horses and that old way of life. I like a foot in both worlds. Um, I, I, I love doing it. It is hard to be economical and make a living with horses and mules, the old fashioned way. But um, if you can, it is a wonderful way of life. Now, did you grow up in this house right here, Mark? Uh, for the most part. Uh, earlier, we took on the wagon ride and showed you where where we uh, lived, I lived there till I was six years old, and the rest of the time I lived right here. Yes, this was home sweet home. So this this house just got electricity in what year? Uh, I would say uh, maybe the late 80s, some of my younger brothers forced it in. So even after your mom and dad was expelled from the church, they still stuck, stuck with the old ways? They they did, because they, they I guess they felt like, you know, maybe they were... Uh, giving in to sin by going away from those old ways that they had lived all their life. Um, yeah, they had lived those old ways all their life. And, 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 and you know, uh, it is so, you know, once you give in, then it's the next thing and it's the next thing. And that was the things they were dragging their feet about. Uh, yeah. So little by little, we saw a phone come in. One of, one of your brothers, who, who was the cause of the phone coming? Little by little, saw the phone come in. I guess the first thing that was... Um, a couple of the younger brothers, uh, Pete and Ben, this is Ben sitting here beside me. They, uh, they went and applied for the phone and mom and dad would not allow that phone to come in the house, but they finally gave them permission that they could put it on the front, on the side porch or out in the shop. And brother Pete, who is not here, actually, as I remember correctly, put that phone in his name. Now, what did you think about that? How old you, were you, Ben, when the phone came in? Teenager? Teenager, yeah. So what? Just, just a lot of changes, as Mark has already uh, stated so well, that took place. I think probably one of the funniest stories out of seeing the things change that comes to my mind is, uh, is Pete getting himself a four-wheeler. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that, was, uh, that was an absolute... Uh, I mean, that was going to take us right straight to hell, according to my parents. And uh, But you know what? Uh, Pete kept that thing hidden back here in this barn through the woods until Dad discovered it. And, uh, you know, the funny thing about it is Dad took a few rides on that four-wheeler. <coughs> it wasn't long, and he owned one himself. I want to go back and say uh, a little more about that. You know, uh, all of us struggled with Mom and Dad because they were holding back and we were going forward. But you know, the, one of the things that I value the most from it all is, is 
Oh. In the end, none of us turned against mom and dad because of it. We we admire today. All of us admire what they taught us. We're very very thankful. I, the older I get, the more thankful I am for the values mm-hmm. that mom and dad taught us. No matter whether we agree with their scriptural references to it. It's it's just the values that they taught us that I hold on very dearly. I, th- I think it's work ethic was just tremendous. Yeah. You know, you didn't quit till it was done. You cleaned up what what needed to be, and you didn't waste nothing. You know that in today's world that's invaluable. You know, yeah. our parents taught us how to how to get somewhere in life, and um, I, I just remember one very vivid uh, memory where mother had supper almost ready and dad goes out the driveway and it was almost dark and she's like oh where's he going now and she got ready had supper ready and and, and dad was back in due time and we're eating supper but mom is just storming mad at him it was obvious and so finally she just blurted out while we were eating supper like where did you have to run off to and i never will forget he looked up off of his bowl of soup and says why in that time i cut and split a whole rick of firewood. <laughs> and you know something? That kind of a thing stuck with me. And I, our parents taught us a, a way of life that very few people get to reap to this day. And I think the word that comes to mind more than anything is that uh, teach and preach to all people and where, whenever needed, use words. And that's the way our parents were they didn't use words a lot. We just learned from them by watching them. So use... Uh, Not watching so much as going along with it. Going along with <laughs> Being it. Being dragged yeah. along and told to do it. Yeah. So you're you're the second oldest one. You're uh, Judy, right? I am. And so what, what was it like as a child? When did you, do you remember seeing watching a TV for the first time? How old were you? Oh my goodness! Probably at the Phillips, is the neighbors here. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Occasionally, we have some neighbor neighbors that still live here. If we went to the neighbors to use the phone, most of the time their TV was on, and we'd see it there. But I don't remember much about that. I hadn't even thought about that, you know. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's the only exposure we had to TV. So your mom and dad never did get a TV here never. in this house. No, uh-huh. no, no way. No way. Uh-huh. How about a radio? Mm-hmm. Well. Dad, Dad probably had one head days. somewhere. He had a CD player. He had a CD player. He would player. have headphones. In, in the later years. Not until right, in the later years. He would listen to gospel music on a CD player. Uh, yeah. First it was a cassette right. player. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was still very respectful of the fact that Grandma didn't want it broadcasted yes. in the house, so he would listen to it on his own time, more or less, you know. Now, did it make a difference of being uh, operated on batteries or... uh... That battery was the only way they could operate because they didn't have electricity in the earlier days. Okay. So, uh, the, uh, you, you was talking, Jonah, about uh, your dad finding uh, the antenna. Tell about the truck story, about how he didn't like it before you listened to the radio on the truck. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Dad didn't, and Mom as well, they didn't want us to have the, you know, the influence of, of uh, ungodly uh, music, and they considered, uh, you know, country music to be off limits, and well, that's what us young boys wanted to listen to, and I remember Leonard, uh, we were hauling water. It was the summer of uh, 1988. It was really dry and hot. And so we were hauling water in the back of that truck to uh, try to preserve one. Was it an acre of cane? I think it was. We had were, a tank in there. Like the we had a tank there. in the back of the truck. And, uh, of course, Dad took the, the antenna out of the truck so it wouldn't, the radio wouldn't pick up. And uh, Leonard had found a way around that. He got a coat hanger and stretched it out and made it a piece of wire and just stuck it into the antenna slot, which it would pick up pretty good. And dad happened up on us and we didn't expect it. And he walked up to the truck and jerked that thing out of the, uh, out of the socket and whacked it across the hood of the truck. He says, why do you boys have this VIP in here? <laughs> and, uh, again, but, uh, yeah, or I said again, but, uh, yeah, we were, and and I look back, and as a dad now, I, I, you know, I, I get dad's heart in his wanting to preserve us from uh, wicked influences and so forth. He was concerned for us, so uh, uh, yeah. I, I remember other times, uh, you know, music wanting to come into the house. I remember 
as a little boy laying in my bedroom hearing, could just barely hear the um, uh, Pete trying to learn to play harmonica in the other room, you know, quietly so the mom and dad couldn't hear it, but he was trying to learn how to play the harmonica, you know, after, after bedtime. So harmonica wasn't allowed? No. No, no I got no. a couple of them smashed from mom. <laughs> Yeah, she found them and smashed them. But now, Jonah, now you're pretty good at harmonica. You play pretty yeah, well. Yeah, I could, I could I tap out a few on one. one. I haven't heard you play harmonica in forever. Pete, mm -hmm. Pete learned to play it real well, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jonah played the dulcimer, too. A little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, all, of us, um, all of us here are instrumental. Uh, our whole family is... Mm. Or, or musically inclined, even our sewing machine is a singer. Well, they say Honda cars were biblical, too. They say all the disciples came together in one accord. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... Now, Nathan, Nathan mm -hmm. you, you kind of married into the family. Uh, what, uh, what, what did you think about the Gunther family when you first met them? Did you know them growing up? or I, I didn't know them growing up, but I've been around these parts, you know, my whole life. And they, they didn't live a whole lot different than my great-grandparents did. Well, when I was growing up, my great-grandparents, they didn't have running water. Um, electricity probably come just before I was born. So, you know, it wasn't a big change for me. And you know, I don't know, when we met and meeting all these, they just seemed like family to me. We had, you know, the same values, same work ethic, and, you know, it's not really common these days, to be honest with you. So one of the things I find that you brought from your mom and dad, uh, although you're not in a Mennonite church, you kept that traditional way of lifestyle, of hard work and family. Uh, getting together, I noticed that... Uh, we're here today on a Sunday, and you all do this quite often. Get together here mm -hmm. at uh, at your mom and dad's uh, house, and it, it is a bit amazing, you know. Here, um, a lot of times, you know, older people die and go on, and families just get rid of everything, you know, and just disperse of it. And and here we are, we're still getting together here. And I would have to think that mom and dad would both be proud of us to that we're. Uh, Still right here where they were, as if though they were here. The only thing that's changed here is they're not here anymore, but everything else is... Mm -hmm. uh, Holly has done just a wonderful job in preserving uh, the home place here, and she's running the store for us. And, and yeah, as Mark said, I think they'd be proud of us because nothing has changed. We haven't sold anything. We haven't dispersed of anything. It, the only thing that happens when we come here is mom and dad ain't here. But we are determined as a family, at least ways for my part, is for us to continue to get together and um, stay in touch with one another, love one another. I mean, if you don't have your family, what do you have? That's one of the things I saw that y'all have a good, uh, strong family ties still. I think all the uh, siblings still live here in Mighty Pond except one. one Leonard. Yes. Leonard. And then we got Doreen. We talked to you last time. You married into the family, so yes, you still practice the Mennonite faith, I guess, as far as ch uh, church and all of that. Yeah, pretty pretty closely. I don't go to a Mennonite church. I go to a fellowship church, but I do have you know strong Mennonite background, so I, I still count myself as a Mennonite. So, Everything, although a lot of people might not in in the area, but anyway, I do. So and I come from Canada too, so a oh, bit, okay. Bit different. So what year did you come to the United States? I came in 1991. Okay. Yeah. So what do you think about the the Gunther family down here? Oh, I love the family. <laughs> yeah. Great family. <laughs> Very fortunate to be a part of the family. Yeah. yeah. And then your daughter Michelle, she's uh, part of the uh, yeah. the uh, bakery and that you yes, all do. And, she is. She does a big part of the baking here. She's mm -hmm. she's our main baker. Yeah. <laughs> she does. She yeah. She does a, a lot. I so, think that title is somewhat disputed, as everybody does their part, and it's all a lot of hard work. But I enjoy being a part of it, and um, it's a special thing to be able to carry on. Grandma did that for. 50, 60 years, and her mother before her as a way of bringing in money to help support the family. And um, 
you know, she had people that would come from Nashville and Knoxville that knew her specifically and came for her bread and her cookies and things. So mm -hmm. I think that's a special thing to be part of carrying on. Talked about this with Holly before about that uh, ever Mennonite community is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Some's a little right. bit more lenient. Some still old order. Uh, it, it, they all vary from, uh, so you're not necessarily in the Mennonite church, but you still carry on the Mennonite traditions and ways and values. And, and the more, values. I would say more of the values, yes. So yeah. The culture as well. Mm -hmm. The culture the is a, a very big part of Mennonite faith. But uh, the modernization, you was a big part of that. I've seen some other videos where you talked about that as far as the sorghum mill. You wanted to be able to p produce more sorghum, and you had to mar use uh, tractors and or maybe a few different things. What, what all did you do to, that, that maybe your parents struggled with you on a little bit? Well, uh, you know, as we grew up, we made sorghum, and it was all, all horse-drawn. We had horse-drawn mills, and, and uh, you know, I rebelled that some. It was just so much hard work, and... Uh, <clears throat> I, I uh, used to when I was young, and I still have the ability to do a lot of a lot of daydreaming, you know, and 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 think about things and and uh, dream up a lot of stuff. And anyway, I had this in mind that I wanted to build modernized equipment to be able to uh, harvest this cane and produce and process more of it. And uh, I think without having been able to do that. We, we would, mom and dad wouldn't have been able to sustain the sorghum making, and none of us certainly couldn't be a part of it anymore because there was just absolutely no way that you can by hand cut and haul in enough cane, press the juice out of it with horses, cook it down, and even think about making a living at it. And so, was blessed with knowledge to dream up equipment, and uh, my brothers helped me with it, we built it, and... Um, We've kept a great business going with it, and Mom and Dad were proud of that. Yes. You still use your uh, horses, though, to cultivate with? Or? Yes, yes, I do. So um, I, I do quite a bit of farming with the horses and the mules, and, and the main reason that I do that is we, uh, my wife Sherry and I, do travel and do sorghum-making demonstrations. And so um, horses and mules, you can't just have them out in the pasture and not do anything with them and then expect them to behave when you go out in the public or go anywhere. You have to work them. They have to be worked. And so, again, as I said earlier, I love a foot in both worlds. And so this has made a way for me to be able to work these horses and mules and be able to sustain ourselves by going doing these demonstrations and get compensation for that and sell our product. And um, so, yeah, I, 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 do, I do work them quite a bit, yeah. How did that start out, you doing the demonstrations? How long, how long have y'all been doing that, like in Cage Cove mm -hmm. in Florida and places? So in 1985, there was a museum, and you, most, a lot of people might know about it. It was the Museum of Appalachia at near Norris, Tennessee, which is 20 miles north of Knoxville. Contacted us, and uh, Dad and I went there and discussed, uh, he, he wanted us, to come to their fall homecoming and do a sorghum making demonstration. I thought that was absolutely the craziest thing I'd ever heard of. I'm like, <laughs> it, it's so difficult at home on the farm that there is no way that you can move equipment somewhere else and do it. But by the time John Rass Irwin, who was the owner of that museum, got through talking and offered compensation for it, I decided to give it a try. And it has been absolute the best thing I've ever done. I absolutely love it. I love going doing these demonstrations because of the people that you meet that come from far and wide from everywhere. We have a great thing going at home going on here at home on the farm, but these people will not come to our farm. We'll never meet up with them here. And so this has opened the door for us to get out and meet so many people. We get compensated for it. We sell our product, a lot of product, and it's done very well for us. Somebody needs to mention too that I think all the siblings here speak Low I Dutch, say, German. What, I don't know speak. which was it. Low German is it? Well, 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 it Take it up and uh, yeah. notch everybody. <laughs> <laughs>
And I don't like it when they speak it. And I, you know, they're all together and speaking it. I feel like they're talking about me. <laughs> and, and we never are. And we never are. Well, I noticed that you all have, uh, especially Mark, has a little bit of that accent still, probably from your mo- from your ancestors, your mom and dad and grandparents. Uh, probably picked that up growing up as a kid and, and so i do have that i do have that accent and i wish i didn't have that accent because we live here in tennessee and i don't need that accent here but like i said in the beginning of this mom uh, uh dad in particular his family came to Saskatchewan, canada and they speak a german a language called lowland Ger- low german and uh um uh, my mother's side of the family speaks a language called swiss and then because of the Mennonite group that they were with, neither they didn't speak either language. They didn't speak Swiss or Low German. They speak a concocted language that's called Pennsylvania Dutch. It's sort of a cross between all of it. And so we all learn to speak all those languages, fluently speak at least three of those different dialects of German. But that's the reason that I have that deep accent and that choppiness and really don't fit in the south here like i'd like to but i can't get rid of it so So growing up as a family did you all speak uh that pennsylvania dutch uh, among each other the mother tongue would have been swiss yes swiss our mother tongue in the household we would have spoke swiss yes mom mom's language was swiss and she for some reason got dad to speak swiss and he's he tried to speak it. It wasn't 100 percent, but Dad he, had his own language. Dad, Dad had his we own. We could understand him. <laughs> but yes, we all we all spoke that Swiss German dialect. I couldn't speak any English. Never heard of the English language until I I was six years old. Went to the first grade. Oh, really? Yes. And um, but we we rarely um, we rarely speak it. Some of us brothers do a little bit, but we all almost all married. English partners, and uh, yeah, for the most part, we speak English amongst each other, but we we can speak it. But Swiss would be our mother tongue. That is what we communicated as growing up. up. Mm-hmm. So some of you, three of the brothers are still in the sorghum business. Yes, and then the That's rest of you are done uh, working in the uh, different things. Uh, I have a barn moving business. Uh, Eddie is in the sorghum. Eddie, Eddie's a partner in the sorghum. And, he and also Pete is a partner in the sorghum that's not here. And then you, uh, Johnny, you build buildings there? Yeah, the portable storage buildings. So we talked earlier about coming and seeing some of that. Uh, yeah. Veterans building one day, that'd so be that'd great. be good. And then Judy would be a dispatcher for uh, for the company. I work for Old Hickory Buildings as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with Same with them. We're so all that's, kind of connected that way. So yeah. that's just, just right down the road here on, on yeah. the left. Uh, and, and I also have a trucking company, and Holly's husband, Nathan, works for me. Mm-hmm. So I think, long story in short, we do all kinds of things, mm-hmm. but the sorghum is the big glue mm-hmm. on the family business that the three brothers... It's a sticky and, business. And they're, <laughs> it's a sticky business. It's a sticky business. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the, the grandchildren work at the sorghum mill and and help with all that and i mean a lot of them don't there's uh my brother brian he's not here he hauls barns as well and uh, my sister heather does real estate and you know just everybody heather's my oldest daughter Mm -hmm. and holly's the youngest one brian's between them and then have a stepdaughter named ashley but now I, I think about all the grandkids have, have either worked at the store or worked in the mm-hmm. sorghum at some point. Or Heather both. used to run the store mm-hmm. or help mm-hmm. grandma with managing it. That's my yeah. sister. Mm-hmm. Heather did. Um, but I think about everybody, all the ladies have worked in the store at one yeah. point or another. Yeah. Um, or so Doreen, you I know Doreen does some extra stuff. You sell some of the uh, jugs that the sorghum goes into. You wholesale those? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, Pete and I have a business where we uh, are distributors for the plastic containers that we use in our sorghum uh, business, and then we distribute to people that make sugar cane syrup and, and of course, to other sorghum makers. So yeah, we do that. Too. So I've noticed some of the um, uh, Mennonites. Uh, they seem to be able to use technology more if it's business related to deal with their business. Does that yeah. seem right? To am I on the right track? Do you? 
Yeah, we use technology. So, so you, because you have to have that to sell online and and. I suppose. Uh, yeah, everybody's different, you know. Like, I mean, we've had a computer for a long time, you know. Before we even had the business, we had a computer. So, I mean, yeah, we Pete and I didn't have a problem with technology. Like, we used. How about television? Do y'all have television? At no, home? we don't have a television. No we never had a TV. So, how, so Michelle, you didn't grow up with a television. Correct. Yeah. How how old was you when you finally got a television then? Um, once you got I guess married? once I yeah when I, when I left home left home yeah got, yeah yep. so yeah it's been it's interesting learning the different uh, uh, history and traditions and how things work and uh, we're looking forward to uh, coming uh, at least once a month and mm -hmm. filming the different things uh, uh, that's going on here that you do throughout the year not I know there've been a lot of videos made. Uh, of the sorghum may come in the fall, but really not a lot so much of what goes on day to day, you know, yeah. of everything. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping to uh, document you all throughout the rest of the year, all the way up till, till fall. And then uh, you've been down, you just got back from Florida. You've been down there doing a, a demonstration for a couple of weeks. So for over 30 years, I've been doing these sorghum making demonstrations. And two years ago, the Florida State Fair saw us doing a sorghum making demonstration and they said they'd like for us to come to Florida and do sugar cane making syrup, a demonstration of it. And so we got together and made a deal and we went last year and now again this year and just really enjoy it. The end, the sugar cane is quite a bit different than sorghum cane, but uh, it, it works very similar and really enjoy it. Yeah, it's uh, 700 miles down to Tampa, Florida where the demonstration was, but we loaded the mules up and took off and went down there and did it. Who takes for, care of your, your animals and yes. your, when you're gone? And you so, have so, so and I have this I have this wonderful niece named Charlotte who is <laughs> who is Eddie's daughter. When we go, uh, whether it's on a cruise or whether we go, uh, uh, go do a sorghum or sugarcane making demonstration, uh, Charlotte takes care of my animals. I have around 140, 150 head of cattle and those horses and mules. And so that's a big load on Charlotte. She does a good job taking care of my stuff. Well, I think we've got a good introduction to the family and uh, people will get a little bit of understanding of, about the tradition and that, uh, that you all come from a very traditional Mennonite family, but you all have kind of a little bit of you of little by little modernized and that makes you not eligible to be in the church, I guess. I guess some of the churches are more... Yeah, we're not eligible to be in the church, no. <laughs> in that Mennonite church, yeah. yeah. There's, That's a good there's, there's, been some, there's been some expelling going on. That has went on, yes. Why don't you all speak a little bit of that Swiss before he shuts it off? No. Well, tell me, uh, <laughs> one thing I do have a question about is about the song, the prayer song that y'all sung. Is that a traditional? Uh, Doxology. Uh, singing is a big um, uh, part of the Mennonite mm -hmm. faith. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of singing that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a very healthy uh, part of the religious life. Mm -hmm. But the Doxology is not a Mennonite hymn. It, it's a It's a traditional hymn. I'd have to look it up to see who wrote it even, but it's, you know, a very old hymn. Okay. But we have sang um, in German, like we sang at my grandmother's funeral service, a German song. Um, what is the God, is the living, God, God, is, God is love. So the... I think singing in general is just the traditional, you know, it's, it's the traditional way of worship. Mm -hmm. There's one thing I could throw to that. Uh, is that we did not do a lot of singing in our home. Uh, mother had a personal belief about singing that four-part harmony was uh, was fleshly. It was, you know, didn't, you should, honor God. didn't honor God. You should only sing the melody part. Mm -hmm. And I look back on it as as feeling a little lost from that because I feel like us as a family... We we can we have singing voices, but because of that, we were we never got to explore that part of singing four part harmony. Uh, I think we I think we craved that, and we craved music, um, which would lead to, you know, why we wanted to uh, further that, you know, like 
Pete trying to learn to play the harmonica, you know, secretly and so forth. But I think that came back, that came from their heritage, you know, uh, that they were just ingrained mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Like that type of singing is old. Like mm -hmm. that's the kind of singing mm -hmm. they did back in the Long Reformation time. Mm -hmm. in time. Like that's, that's a very old way of, mm -hmm. of singing. So I don't even know. I've, I've thought about looking up when four-part harmony, when people started to do that. I've, I've wondered, you know, when that started. But, but, uh, but that type of singing is only done by the Amish anymore, I mm -hmm. think, really. And the traditional Old Order yeah, Mennonite, Old Order yeah. Mennonites, yeah. Well, I think we've had a good meeting, and uh, I really appreciate y'all letting me come out and learn a little bit about y'all's history and family. All right. Sorry, we'll do, we'll sorry do more. That you had to miss uh, uh, my brother Pete. He's... Uh, Pete would be the second son. He, he's right about next behind Judy. He's Doreen's and, husband. And he's single handedly the best storyteller of all of us. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's, but probably, a little camera shot. he's probably not here because he's got one lens missing. He's having oh. LASIK surgery, so that's, oh, yeah. he's got one, one <laughs> little camera shot. Well, okay, well, we'll maybe, get, maybe we'll get him in on another video. Oh, we'll time. catch him by surprise the yeah. next time. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best way to do it. Then he's yeah. got no way out. Just, he, <laughs> Pete, Pete, hands down, is the life of the party. We didn't need a TV when, when we had when, Whenever around. Pete's here, it's interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, you was talking about the uh, uh, the brothers, older brothers, bringing in some uh, cassette tapes for y'all to listen to. Snake would sneak them in. Yeah, yeah, I remember Leonard bringing in. I think it was Leonard, or I'm not sure which one brought in some comedy tapes uh, about Ernest and Elwood. Some just <laughs> hilarious stories, you know. It was right down our alley, and we'd laugh. And, yeah. Well, that this family did not have TV uh, or any of the modern day entertainment. So we learn how to entertain ourselves. And that is one thing that I miss a lot. And that's one of the reasons I love getting together with family here on Sunday afternoons is because there's no TV, there's, we entertain each other. And I love that, I think that's great.